Thank you so much, Chairperson, for your great introduction. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I said it is always a great experience to be here in Ahmedabad with uh, such lovely hospitality. It almost feels like coming home. So with this, uh, and I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Ruthul, Dr. Bansi, sir, for having me in this. Uh, so I'm extremely glad to be part of this forum where we are discussing, deliberating GDM, I think this is probably one of the very important phases where blood sugar control is of paramount importance, not to one, but two lives, isn't it? And thankfully, the silver lining is, it is the only time that patients are willing to forward advice to the team, and they're extremely determined also to get the blood sugar under control. Now, yesterday, before I took my flight here, I saw a GDM patient uh, with the family members and all of that were very inclined, very determined to follow any protocol to get the blood sugar under control. They know that, you know, the uh, obstetrician is waiting there to bounce back to us. Anything goes wrong, they're going to blame it on blood sugar, right? So that's how we are like walking on thin ice. And then I saw another patient immediately after a GDM, who's also a, you know, just a regular type 2 diabetic patient, who's in a catabolic state, having 300 or four sugars, and I told him, your sugars are soys. He tells me, Doctor, last last week was 500, so don't bother. <laughs> That's how it is. At least in GDM, we know that they have a complete uh, attention, right? So today, I'm going to navigate and show you which of these modalities is going to be the most pragmatic option for patients with not only gestational diabetes. My talk is going to entail also pre-gestational diabetes, which includes type one diabetic women as well as type two diabetic women who undergo pregnancy. So with this introduction, we have data to suggest that about 17% of women undergoing pregnancy have some form of diabetes, of course, gestational diabetes being the most common form. And we also know gestational diabetes increase this, increases the risk of overt diabetes later on subsequently in their life. Now the challenges are the maternal hyperglycemia can have fetal hyperinsulinemic responses. We saw from Asasia Serge's uh, presentation today, this predisposes fetus for large for gestational age babies and then overweight babies at birth and then you have childhood obesity and then there's always almost like one way road leading to metabolic diseases such as diabetes. So what are the glycemic targets in pregnancy? Again, we saw from Tasha Sir's presentation, the targets are always very, very stringent. There are certain different professional societies having so slight subtle variations, but however, we are all due to the fact the numbers are extremely stringent. But what is also very important is patients who are already having pre-gestational diabetes, be it type 1 or type 2, it is extremely important to get the blood sugar under control prior to conception, right? Because when hyperglycemia at conception could increase not only not only fetal anomalies, but also can cause missed abortions, can have an ill effect, can have a negative effect on the embryonic development itself. So it is extremely important to schedule the pregnancies and patients could be actually chosen to take insulin if not under control. So pre-conception blood sugar is of paramount importance. So now coming to A1C, A1C, you know the RBC turnover is high, but also it's a reflection of three months, right? In a, in a patient with gestational diabetes, three months is going to be a long time, right? We want something which gives you, uh, we know the dynamic variations, dynamic, dynamic changes that happens during pregnancy also needs dynamic response, right? So we used to rely on fructose monocytes. We used to look at blood sugar, self-monitoring of blood glucose. Now we are blessed with the, both the ambulatory as well as the real-time CGMS, which gives us deeper insights to blood sugar variations, right? and kind of sheds lights to the time in range, time above range, and allows us to titrate insulin far better. So managing diabetes, of course, the fundamental should never be underestimated. The role of uh, the role of exercise and diet, patients with type 1, pretty easy insulin, and then metformin. The first study to actually show that metformin could be used is metformin in gestational diabetes study by Rowan. Uh, so that was the first study which came up. It showed not just effects, positive effects, for the uh, for the maternal, but also for the offsprings. So after about two years, capillar pole thickness was seen. Metformin used with gestational mothers could also be beneficial for the offsprings. But however, 
metformin alone may not be sufficient, you would require insulin as the pregnancy uh, advances. Now, coming to the crux of my talk, comparing insulin pumps as well as multiple daily insulin. So, which of these should we suggest to our patients? Now, the insulin pumps have advanced tremendously. These are no more tools just delivering insulin like before, right? Like this is I call like a phone phones to smartphones. These have a closed loop device where they have the capacity, artificial intelligence, machine learning to actually adjust, automate the basal rate according to patient's glycemic variability, right? The human intervention is almost remote. Now, many of my patients who are on this pump, the timing range is over 97, 98%, almost 100%. It's unimaginable. It's like a game changer, right? And these also have algorithms to actually keep the patients devoid of hyperglycemia. They have algorithms which predict hyperglycemia even four or five hours later. So they kind of suspend the insulin release, right? These are how the pumps are completely advanced. No, they are absolute game changes, no doubt about that. Let's see some of the limitations in the subsequent slide. But multiple daily insulins, these have been the conventional approach over the years. This is probably the most practical choice because, you know, it is very affordable, it is quite easy, and it is very convenient, right? Some of the limitations of the pump, of course, the expense is huge, right? It may be justified in a type 1 diabetic patient undergoing pregnancy because, you know, it is, the patient can be using the pump for many, many years. But it could be extreme for a patient who needs a capital investment. Forget about the re uh, recurring cost of ten thousand. Capital investment of five to six lakhs for a period of six to eight months is quite extreme, right? So not too sure whether we can convince such patients. Infusion site reactions. If you are looking at only a term for pregnancy, is not a concern. Risk of decay. Certain studies have shown before the that's because of the tube blockages or also because of concomitant infections, but then we need to consider or rescue medicine and educate the patients. Some have phobias of, you know, being uh, being used to the gadget here. They may not be very comfortable. And of course, most patients have to be motivated to change the tubes, to calibrate the sensors, check the blood sugars. In case the sensor wants calibration, you need to check more often, so on and so forth. So these are some of the limitations. Now, this is the publication in 2013. Mind you, this is comparing the pre-generation pumps. So this study, this was published in obstetric medicine, showed there's actually not much of a difference between both the pumps and multiple daily infusions. If you look at, in the study of Chen et al, it actually had a little higher amount of DK in the, in the pump group that was actually because of concomitant infections. There was higher rate of neonatal hypoglycemia again in the pump group, and neonatal hypoglycemia is hypoglycemia in the infants of the first day of birth, less than 40 milligrams. That's because of maternal blood sugar levels. That was again seen in the pump group. However, in the Chico et al, there was a little bit of a large gestational age in the pump group. Otherwise, if you see more or less, there's not much of a difference in the main outcomes, including HPLMC, including maternal and fetal outcomes. So what happens in 2016, the Cochrane Review looked at detailed analysis, assessments and analysis and kind of concluded that neither one is superior to the other. Right. So it left to the treating clinicians that either of them could be actually used depending upon the patient profile. Now I'm going to show you this data of type 1 diabetic patients. There are a lot of studies who underwent pregnancy. There was about 47 meta-analysis, 47 studies included. 43 were non-RCTs, all type 1 diabetic patients comparing uh, infusion therapy to multiple daily infusion therapy. The first trimester, in fact, the pump therapy was better the multiple daily infusion. This was probably because preconception, the blood sugar control was very good in the pump arm, which kind of extended carried over to the first trimester. However, in the subsequent trimesters, there was not much difference between both the arms. So both MDI as well as pump were quite similar. However, in the pump pump, the insulin requirement was quite low because the base load rates can be staggered, right? It can be easily optimized. So it goes a little low and consequently also resulting in Less amount of hyperglycemia. This itself is a takeaway, isn't it? If you have a lower amount of hyperglycemia, itself is a takeaway. However, to everyone's surprise, this is probably the largest trial, concept trial in type 1 diabetic patients, in about 200 and over patients. Now, to everyone's surprise, over here in this, you can look up, this is not very clear. Uh, I'll read it out to you. About 53 patients out of 102 patients with pump achieved the target HPLC of less than 6.5. 
However, in the MDA arm, about over 70 patients achieved the target HPLC, clearly demonstrating MDI could be actually superior to pump in this concept trial. So this was actually a surprise, and not just that, at birth, the neonatal hypoglycemia was higher than the pump arm, neonatal admissions were higher, and gestational hypertension was also higher than the pump arm, but actually caused, came as a cause of cancer. But later on, there was another observational study this was the first study to include a sensor augmented pump, which is a first generation sensor augmented pump, which was Medtronic Abu and Medtronic Paradigm 732. And remember, this first generation sensor augmented pump are not having the AI capacity as of now. They just have the threshold for alerts both high and low blood sugar. This itself kind of showed that blood sugar, in fact, was much better, not just a preconception but at every stage of pregnancy, including the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and so on. So this clearly shows that as pumps are getting advanced, we are able to get definitely much blood sugar control with advancing technology. So as you can clearly see, the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester, the blood sugar level is much better. Now in the concept study, was taken up after this such robust results and one of the reasons why in the concept study uh, the pump arm had hyperglycemia towards the second and third phase trimesters was one of the reasons that was cited by the authors is because the day-to-day -day variability of insulin pharmacokinetics changed very rapidly in pregnancy. If you look at the absorption rate of insulin it reduces by about one and a half to percent every week, right? So if insulin is absorbed at a particular time at about 12 weeks of gestation, if you look at a 28 or 30 weeks gestation mother, the insulin absorption actually decreases by about 50 percent. Now, the concept study also was the first study to use CGMS for both MDI and insulin pumps. And the clinicians with the CGMA data were able to titrate insulin far better, dynamically respond, and able to bring the blood sugar control. Although CGMS were there, there was not advanced pump in the, not the AI pump in the concept trial. And there was also a little reluctance of meal timing of insulin and calculating carbohydrate to insulin ratio. So these were some of the points probably uh, ending up in uh, favor of MDI and, uh, and the, the pump not getting their cells as expected. But however, the observational studies kind of shed light that pump would perhaps be the way forward. And this is the final meta-analysis to have published this year, which also looked at the contemporary insulin pumps, showing that blood sugar control was quite effective in the pumps. However, there were a couple of concerns where there was a higher odds of ratio for cesarean delivery and for large gestation age, which requires further evaluation in future studies. So there are a lot more uh, studies underway, which have included the current generation pumps. And as I alluded to during the beginning of my talk, I think that would be the future. That would perhaps be the future. I think they will get the time and range to over 98%. Uh, and that uh, studies, we have to wait till they are rolled out. Finally, to conclude at this point in time, I think, uh, uh, as long as we get the sugar, blood sugar controlled and prevent complications, I think we get the job done. That finally, that's what matters. And basically, finally, it, it also boils down to a lot of factors, including patient's affordability, patient's comfort. I think it needs to be a much collaborative effort from the treating physician as well as the patient's, uh, patient's comfort levels. And I think after that, we need to make our decision. So with this, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.